Hello, people of Melbourne. Welcome to The Cutting Room. I'm your host, Guy Cunningham. And hi, I'm Sarah Bliss. And I'm Courtney Holder. We're here to sort out the hot mess of today's media landscape, to sift the pearls from the peanuts and to help you find your media sweet spot. That's right. We'll be testing TV, prodding print media and scrutinising streaming. Which platforms can proudly cruise the infotainment highway and which ones need a jump start? Who can you trust and who's trying to fleece you? Last week, we put radio to the test. Tonight, we turn the spotlight on TV. Is TV providing the inclusive, positive content we all need right now? How is free-to-air bracing against a tsunami of streaming with up to 90% of younger viewers making the switch to subscription television? Are we hearing enough local voices that reflect the society around us? We'll be sending out our reporter, James McLean, to get the skinny on telly. And we'll chat all things TV with the project's Amanda Buckley, who also firing up her new show on our very own Channel 31. But first, let's take a look at the recent media news. Two Australian First Nations films have made the list for the Toronto International Film Festival, one of the world's most prestigious showcase events. We Are Still Here, an Australian, New Zealand and Islander collaboration, has already done the rounds in this year's Sydney and Melbourne festival circuits. Featuring eight short stories, it explores Indigenous responses to the arrival of Captain Cook and European culture. The short film I'm on Fire follows an Indigenous boy who makes mixtapes to deal with family and coming of age problems and has been acclaimed as ferociously energetic. With several other local productions accepted at Toronto, Screen Australia praised the Australia's wealth of talent and the international appetite for Australian stories. Meanwhile, after announcing that it will be cracking down on password sharing, Netflix has launched its Out of Home feature this week in South America. The new system charges an additional monthly fee every time users stream on a TV or a TV connected device that is outside the primary household linked to the account. Netflix reported in April that over 100 million households share passwords, 30 million of those in the US and Canada, hinting that North America may soon face similar charges. To soften the blow, Netflix has also announced plans to roll out a cheaper, ad-supported subscription tier, its first venture into advertising since the streaming juggernaut launched in 2007. This week also saw the streaming premiere of HBO's House of the Dragon. The, la the long-awaited prequel to Game of Thrones is set 200 years earlier and follows the rise and fall of the fire-resistant, dragon-riding and slightly mad House Targaryen. Season 1, featuring 10 episodes, is co-created by George R. R. Martin and follows portions of his 2018 book, Fire and Blood. The series, filmed in the UK and Spain, has a lot to live up to and will also need to overcome major fan blowback for the universally despised finale of Game of Thrones, the most highly watched series ever to air. Meanwhile, as the US midterms approach, TikTok is promising to crack down on election misinformation chaos. It already has a strict ban on paid political posts, but that hasn't deterred politicians from creating a presence on the platform. We saw TikTok posts come into play earlier this year in the Australian federal election. Early data shows that the platform is able to swing voting patterns in young adults new to politics, though it isn't likely to influence those with established political beliefs. To combat broader election smear tactics, TikTok will introduce an election center, which will connect users to reliable sources of political information. Twitter and Meta pledged to also increase efforts to police misleading election content. The winners of the Australian Podcast Awards were announced this week. Finalists in the Best Podcast of the Year included a strong lineup of female voices, stories, and advice, including My Sister's Secrets, The Jess Rowe Big Talk Show, and She's on the Money. Ultimately, Best Podcast was awarded to the poignant and often hilarious Come Out Wherever You Are, hosted by Sean Zepps who chats with guests from across Australia's gender and sexual spectrum about their unique coming out experiences. Meanwhile, in Australian games, some of the developers behind the widely successful Hand of Fate, now under the name Spitfire Interactive, have announced their next project, Capes. Described as a gritty turn-based RPG, a team of superheroes must retake a city controlled by supervillains. With a focus on diverse characters and novel superpowers, the game incorporates the advanced tactical mapping of the role-playing elements that enthralled Hand of Fate fans and promises to be a worthy successor. Capes will launch on Steam for quarter one next year. And that's it for this week's news. We'll be back with more Cutting Room. Don't go away.
and this week's investigation is into that great media survivor, television. Thanks largely to streaming services, TV is said to be enjoying its golden age. But is that good news for viewers, let alone the local industry? James McLean settled in to find out. Good evening and welcome to television. Television broadcasting began in Australia in Sydney on TCN9 in September 1956. By November, when the Olympic flame was lit at the MCG, Melbourne had two TV stations, HSV7 and the ABC. Back then, TV sets were crazy expensive, so most people got their first look at the new technology through shop windows as part of a large crowd. Early advertisements for TV promised entertainment, culture, humour and education. Yet before long, TV became known as the idiot box. At least it was free to air. Until January 1957, when TV licences were introduced, uniting viewers in resenting the fee. It was dropped in 1974. TV watching was a group effort. From the Apollo moon landing in 1969 to scandalous Australian made shows like Number 96, and the switch from black and white to colour, live, on March 1st, 1974. By the late 70s, Kerry Packer's Channel 9 led the push for national commercial television and radio networks. 1985 brought radical changes to media ownership laws in Australia, allowing television proprietors like Kerry Packer to control stations reaching 60% of the national audience, but no newspapers or radio in the same market. The market was already changing with new technology bringing TV's next bold move, cable TV. But didn't we already learn with TV licences that people wouldn't want to pay? Fast forward to the 2020s. It now seems likely the COVID pandemic and streaming services will be the death of free-to-air TV. ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, crunched the numbers and found, in 2021, for the first time, online subscription services surpassed live free-to-air TV, 58% to 50. Two years earlier, 61% watched free-to-air. That's a problem for Australian-made productions and the local screen industry. So the push is on to impose an Australian content quota of about 20% on the streaming services. The French went ahead and did just that in June. So companies like Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon will have to invest 20 to 25% of their French revenues in French content. Screen producers Australia and other industry guilds want similar quotas on streamers here, arguing it's a life and death situation for the local screen industry. The former government also cut local content quotas on free-to-air commercial TV networks last year, and investment in Australian drama has dropped. But investment in children's TV by free-to-air commercial stations is almost extinct, according to a report by the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Meanwhile, ABC series like Bluey, Hardball and First Day are collecting awards, accolades and hearts across the world. Yet there's now less investment in local children's TV. Hello, I'm James and I'm here with Jenny Buckland, who is the CEO of the Australian Children's Television Foundation. Jenny, thank you very much for joining us on The Cutting Room. Thanks for inviting me, James. Um, now, just to start with, um, why do you think it is important to have Australian stories as part of children's television programming? Oh, I think there's a million reasons uh, why it's important, James. Uh, I think... Um, the fundamental reason is how important it is for us to all to see ourselves represented on television. When we do that, we feel as though we're really a part of a, a community and that our place in the world is validated. Uh, so it's really important to have a wide variety of different content for kids and Australian content because they're, we're not a homogenous society in Australia. We live in many different parts of the country, mm. we live in many different ways. So we need a variety of shows that are relatable to us. It's an opportunity to uh, see ourselves, understand that the situation we find ourselves in is something that's shared by others. And it's also an opportunity when you're seeing someone in a different position to walk around in their shoes and think about what it's like to be them. Yeah. Um, how do you think the industry has changed in the amount of time that you've been working in it? The biggest change is the role of commercial broadcasters in children's television. So when I started, a lot of the really iconic shows that uh, people who are growing up now would remember, uh, particularly people who grew up in the 1990s would remember, shows like Round the Twist, shows like Spellbinder, Escape from Jupiter, 
um, and then later th uh, programs like Mortified. A lot of people remember these shows. They were actually commissioned by commercial broadcasters. We forget because quite a few of the men ended up on the ABC. Mm. But back then the ABC didn't do as much children's drama. It certainly had its in-house productions, Play School and Behind the News, and everybody watched at school. Um, but it didn't do as much drama as the commercial broadcasters did because they had a quota requiring them to do it. And then in about 2009, ABC started its children's channels, which was quite transformative. A whole heap of fantastic children's shows that other younger people again remember, like Dance Academy, My Place, and more recently, Little Lunch and Hardball. These all came through the ABC and that was quite transformative. But at the same time, the commercial broadcasters started spending less and less on children's television. So are there any quotas in place currently for streaming services like Netflix to have to put on Australian children's content? No, but that's the subject um, of a great big review. Yeah. Bef the previous government had actually put out a green paper proposing a, a quota for the commercial broadcasters. They proposed that they would be, should be required to spend 5% of their Australian revenue, but no requirement to do children's. Mm. They lost the election. That discussion is now happening again as part of the current minister is having a review. He's calling it the National Cultural Policy Review. And he's not just looking at the screen sector. He's looking at arts across the board. But there's um, certainly a lot of push through that, that there should be a, an expenditure quota for the streaming platforms and that within their overall, which should be higher than 5%, hmm. and within their overall uh, quota, they should um, enable a chunk of that to be for children's content. Yeah, are there quotas in place for Australian broadcasters to include children's television? Well, there's absolutely no requirement on the ABC, which a lot of people are surprised about. Mm. We, we just have to trust that they'll keep seeing themselves as the home of children's television. And there used to be a requirement on the commercial broadcasters, which was, a, it averaged out at being 32 hours per year of Australian children's drama, first release Australian children's drama. So with three commercial broadcasters, that meant 96 hours of children's drama. But in 2020, the uh, Commonwealth Government, uh, the easy way to say it is that they removed the obligation. They didn't exactly remove it, they just made it no longer a requirement. So right. they retained the requirement that there be 50% Australian content on commercial television. But within that, there used to be sub quotas where each one had to do minimum levels of adult drama, documentary and ch children's content. They made it the case that the broadcasters could just choose which they do. And the result is that they barely choose children's television. They will always choose a prime time adult audience mm. over investing in, in children. So as um, viewers and um, you know, consumers of media, what, what, can, what can audience do to help to support Australian children's television? Um, definitely try and find it if you've got mm. kids um, and, and sort of encourage and direct your kids to that content. That's one of the issues actually in streaming platforms is how any of us find local content on those platforms. Um, we can all actually make a submission to the um, government's national cultural policy. It's just pretty simple. You can go on there, have your say website and literally um, feed into there whatever you think is important so you can let people know. Yep. Um, I think just generally being vocal, you can if you really feel strongly about it, you can let your local member of parliament know. Mm. Um, there's a lot of talk about children's content at the moment um, and it really uh, helps when people let the politicians know that they care about Australian children's content. Mm. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us um, and we'll go back to the studio. If you want to get involved and have your say, email culturalpolicy@arts.gov.au and let them know how you feel. Stay tuned viewers, we'll be back with more after this short break. Welcome back to the show. Today we have special guest Amanda Buckley joining us to discuss the topic of television. To get to know Amanda's amazing career, let's go to field reporter Maddie Weeks. Amanda Buckley has been performing for over 20 years for theatre, corporate and festival audiences, both in Australia and overseas. 
including at all the usual comedy and improv festivals. In 2010, Amanda was a part of the Aussie Improv Explosion, the first Australian troupe to perform at the Del Close Marathon in New York, as well as winning the prestigious Cranston Cup as one third of Bavaria's worst. Amanda has trained, performed and taught in Australia with Impro Australia, Impro Melbourne, Improv Theatre Sydney, The Big Hoo-Ha Melbourne, Impromptunes and Spark. Internationally, Amanda has trained with Jason Chin, Jill Bernard and Joe Bill. Along with Jamie Burgess, Amanda created the Musical Improvisation Intensive Workshop, the Musical Toolkit, which they have led all across Australia and New Zealand. Notable show credits include Murder Village, The Saboteur, Return of the Secret Seven and Eurovision. Amanda most recently has appeared in a series of sketches for Channel 10's The Project and in the miniseries Fires for ABC TV. And coming up soon, Amanda will be starring in the Buckley Sessions on Channel 31 for RMI TV. Amanda, thank you for joining us in the studio. And thanks for having me in the studio. <laughs> this is exciting. Um, thank you for whatever that was. Many weeks, I'm looking at you, drumming me up some business. I love it. Well, we can give you that for later on, thank so you can you. whack it on your socials and get even more jobs than you're currently yeah. doing all over the television. Now, to start this thing off, you've got a new show coming up, which apparently only just found out that when it was airing. Yes, I did. But a new show coming up on Channel 31, and I mentioned this to start this off because you, uh, during the making, I've heard during the making of this show, you really put emphasis, because you're coming out of COVID, on making sure that it was a great vibe and making sure that you were producing something really positive for and your viewers. Yeah, I just... um. I'm a bit over kind of like the mean comedy that's out there. So I really wanted to make sure that no matter what we did, we were punching up. Um, even with each other, you know, just it's very easy to kind of, you know, have a gentle ribbing with people. But I really wanted to make sure that we didn't do that. We wanted to try really hard to just keep it really, you know, if we're giving up our time and we're working hard and we're asking our crew to work such long hours. Um, let's just have a really great experience. And hopefully that translates to the audience. I mean, you might have been on it a few times, Guy. And, That's um, definitely not why I've got you on here. I'm definitely not cross-promoting We have a reciprocal show. arrangement. I mean, but it brings us to a really important point, which was that um, during that time, and especially over the last three years, we have, there's been times when I've had to turn off the television because it's too much. You know, the world's been cra crazy and hectic, and just for my own mental health, I've, I've had to turn off some television. So being a content creator, I guess, here in Australia, um, how important was it to you to not be one of those things that people had to switch off? Yeah, well, it's, um, I really wanted that because it's not really part of who I am as a performer as well. Um, I mean, this is so naff, but my, a lot of people call me AB, my initials are AB, and uh, my blood type is AB positive. And I, for some reason, have just decided that that's who I am. I am AB positive. And I really want to kind of be that and radiate that because it's too easy being in comedy as well, there's so much, um, there's a place for it, but so much of it is mean, so much of it is cynical, and I, I would like to, if I feed into that, then that becomes my mental state as well, so I do like to try and be different with it and a bit more open and uplifting, and, and the comedians and um, television shows that I've always been into actually fall into that anyway. Mm. So, you know, growing up I was, you know, French and Saunders and Ab Fab, and then in Australia it would have been, um, you know, oh, just... Kath and Kim and all those, uh, the big gig and all that's like wacky, crazy, let's just go and have a really good time stuff. Mm. So, and the late show, all of that. I mean, obviously a lot of ABC content um, and heaps of Channel 31 content. Oh, always, always, always like on the, the ABC. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so yeah, that did mean a lot to me to kind of have that at the front of my mind when creating things. And even with, um, I, you had a lot of the project sketches that I've been so lucky to be a part of. And they're really, obviously, they're um, satirical, they're political commentary. Um, but there's something about each of those characters, even though the commentary is always on whatever negative political thing was happening, especially during COVID, um, that the characters I would play would be uh, 
happy with who they are. They even if they're in the middle of you know the um, shitstorm, if I can say shitstorm, that is no. um, you know the handling of COVID. Sorry, I already said it. Oh, so damn, can't go back with beauty of improv. Anarchy, anarchy. <laughs> um, that's me. Um, oh no, I was, I was just gonna, and then I thought there's probably water in it. I don't, it, know, and I what, I don't know what you're doing with that. <laughs> get away from it. it. Um, yeah, that, that that we could make sure that that person, that character that I would play would be upbeat and um, loving their job and, um, you know, even if they have to do really horrible things, they're always like best foot forward, you know, and um, yeah, I like that. I try to, I try to be that. It, it does help. It helps my own mental state as a performer. Obviously, like you, you, you've got this show, it's coming out on Channel Day One yeah. and it's all about community TV shows and you're talking about the community. Do you feel like um, a lot of community TV and obviously the station itself is very sort of positive towards bringing people into community, especially after COVID? Or do you still think there's a bit of navigating to do? Do you think it could be broader or they yeah. could be doing more things with I it? I don't think, um, I mean, I don't think there's a yes or no answer. I think there's so many positives that are happening. The fact that um, a middle-aged woman could, with, with minimal um, profile, could be asked to host her own show, um, you know, that just doesn't happen. So um, there's a diversity tick. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've got this old lady on TV. Isn't this remarkable? Um, <laughs> But there is, you know, that idea of making sure that the guests are local and, and even even with what you're doing here, you're making sure that you're speaking to local people in the industry and people whose voices should be, we should be hearing from. I think there's always still work to do. And the fact that we keep asking is good. Like, we can't just go, well, we did it, guys. We did that one thing. Yeah. We did it once. Problem solved. Tick. And it's over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> as long as we keep talking about it and keep asking about it, but... Um, I think it is doing stuff. I mean, we've all been there. We've all been channel flicking and we kind of go, what's this? Oh, wow, I'm discovering a program I didn't know was on. And then suddenly you're back 11 p.m. watching it every Friday night or, you know, during the daytime you have a cup of tea and you see what's on. You can discover all kinds of different things on this channel because the space is there for these people to put something forward. And then people like them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. <laughs> Well, the Buckley Sessions begins airing on the 10th of September, 10 p.m. here on Channel 31. Last week, we asked you to submit your own personal ratings for radio using our 5E system. And without further ado, let's discuss the results. All right. So uh, if you have a look here on our screen, this is our fancy new graphic that we've got here. The audience has voted. We've got an amazing, overwhelming response to this uh, survey. And this is great, but we've only got a window of 36 hours to get in there. Uh, did it in which, you, as you can see, four points, three points for engagement, four points for Evolve Positively, another four for Education Factually, another four for Radio Entertainment. And the uh, secret question was, what do you think about our new look show? Five points, which adds up to a total of 19 out of 25 from you guys there in the audience. But another big total is 106 out of 125, a great way to start radio there. So... After considering the multiple angles and opinions, how does TV shape up? Well, let's take it through our own personal gauntlet, the five E's. The five E's are as follows. Does it enrich you? Does it educate you? Does it promote community engagement? Does it entertain you? And finally, has it evolved positively over the last five years? Sarah, kick us off. Does it enrich you television? Absolutely. If it's on, I can't take my eyes off it. Look, I'm going to give it a three just because I don't know if I, be I become a better person after having watched it or even if I become a person having watched it. <laughs> I'm going to split the difference with a four. I think most of what I watch, I think, I think enriches me, but every now and then I just watch trash. <laughs> and I was going to give it a three because I also just watch trash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, factual educate. Sarah, where are we at? I'm at a three. I believe that it, it's out there. I just don't really want to watch it all the time. I agree. I'm also giving it a three. Uh, I think there should be more checks and balances with regards to factually educating in, uh, in the media. Uh, and a three is what you get. Yeah, three is a magic number. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a magic number. <laughs> and I went for a two, but I, that is from own personal preference. I don't go out of my way to watch factually educating things, so I can only blame myself for that, really. <laughs> 
Well, uh, brings us to the next one. Does it promote community engagement? I don't believe it really does promote community engagement. For me, it's me and the TV. That's about it. I am 100% with you on that. There's a one for community engagement. Unless that a community is me and I'm watching community on television, then that's why I give you the one. I, I couldn't be more different. I'm going to say a four, mainly because of the conversations I have around TV with my own community. I'm probably answering the question wrong, but I don't need to explain myself. It's a four. That's why I've got the roadie. <laughs> <laughs> um, from my own personal experience in the UK, we don't have community TV, so I don't really experience that. But obviously, being on a community television station, you get an extra point. You get two. <laughs> uh, does it entertain? Absolutely. There's just been nothing like it, really. I agree. This is where TV absolutely shines. There's more choices than ever. You can watch Below Decks on Hulu if you want. You can watch whatever. Five. Yeah. Um, I learned to sew because of TV. I learned to cook because of TV. And now I'm learning how to be a mum, a wife, a friend. I love TV. TV rules. <laughs> Fives all round. <laughs> Uh, what have we got next? Does it entertain you? We've just done that. Does it evolve positively over the last five years? How's it evolved? Four. I think it's evolved way beyond what we've expected, but uh, some negatively, though. I'm giving it a three. It was going in the right direction, but now it seems to be they're trying to get more and more money out of us. I'm spending like $150 on all these cheap things that now, because I've got so many of them, but yeah, three for you. Shut up and take my money. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that here? Yeah, well, it's already out there. <laughs> and I'm going to go for a two because I feel like we may be in a stagnating period purely because of like the whole Netflix thing. Where are we going from there? I don't know. I feel like we've evolved and we're looking for a new place to go. Yeah, we are in a, a state of flux. That w I'm so good at maths. 67 out of 100 from us here on the panel. And those are our scores. But what about yours? Hop on to our Instagram, Twitter and Facebook accounts and let us know if you believe TV is a positive medium for information and entertainment. Voting ends on Wednesday at midday. And that's the program for tonight. Who's next on the hit list, Guy? Well, next week's investigation will be into the world of podcasts. Are they a source of education, likeable personalities, or just rubbish opinions? We'll find out soon enough, but until then, be mindful of the media you consume, and good night.